The Ninth Sunday After Pentecost The Gospel of the Sunday According to Luke At that time, when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known, and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground. And thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the rulers of the people sought to destroy him. The words of the Gospel. Exposition from the Catena Aurea. And when he drew near, seeing the city, he wept over it. All the beatitudes of which Jesus spoke in the Gospel he confirms by his own example. Just as he had said, Blessed are the meek, he confirms this where he says, Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. And just as he had said, Blessed are ye that weep, he also wept over the city. So we read, When he drew near. For Christ, who wishes all men to be saved, had compassion on these, and this would not have been very evident to us unless made so by some very human gesture. Tears shed, however, are a sign of sorrow. The compassionate Savior weeps over the ruin of the faithless city, which the city itself did not know was to come. And so we have, If thou hadst also known, and that in this thy day, implying you also would have wept, who now, not knowing what threatens you, rejoice. Hence there follows, And that in this thy day, for in that day in which she was giving herself to the delights of the body, she had within her the things which could have been for her peace. Why it was she held the delights of the present for her peace is made clear when he adds, But now they are hidden from thine eyes. For if the evils that threatened were not hidden from the eye of her heart, she would not have rejoiced in her present prosperity. For this reason he then adds the punishment which threatened it, when he says, For the days shall come upon thee, and thy enemies. If thou also hadst known, the Jews were not worthy of perceiving the meaning of the divinely inspired scriptures, which speak of the mystery of Christ. For as often as Moses has read to them, a veil is drawn over their heart, so that they may not see what has been fulfilled in Christ who as the reality scatters the shadows, and because they had taken no notice of the truth, they have made themselves unworthy of the salvation that flows from Christ. And so there follows, and that in this thy day. Where he makes a reference to the fact that his coming took place for the peace of the whole world. For to this end he came, that he might preach to far and near, but because they were unwilling to receive the peace that was announced to them, he hid it from them. So we read, But now they are hidden from thine eyes. And in this way he foretells very clearly the siege that in a short while will come upon them, saying, For the days shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee. Here the Roman emperors are referred to, for here is described that overthrow of the people of Jerusalem, which was the work of the Roman rulers, Titus and Vespasian. And then follows, And compass thee round, and straighten thee on every side. How all these prophecies were fulfilled, we may read, in what Josephus has written, who, though a Jew, yet each single incident he relates is in exact accord with what was foretold by Christ. And beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children... And this detail is also added, And they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone. This is testified to by the fact of the translation of the city, 
for the new city is now built where Christ was crucified, outside the gate, while the former Jerusalem, as it is called, was totally uprooted. And the crime for which this uprooting was the punishment is then added, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation, that is, of my coming. For I came to see and to save you. And had you known and believed in me, you might have been at peace with the Romans and escaped all danger, as all who believed in Christ escaped. I do not deny that the former Jerusalem was destroyed because of the iniquity of its inhabitants, but I ask if this weeping does not perhaps relate to this your, this your Jerusalem. For if anyone should fall into sin, after receiving the mysteries of truth, he is wept over. No one of the Gentiles is wept over, but he who belonged to Jerusalem and has ceased to be. For our Redeemer never ceases to weep through his elect, when he sees those who from a good life have come to wicked ways. If these had known of the damnation that threatens them, they would, with the elect, have wept over themselves. The corrupted soul has here its day, and takes its delight in the passing hour. To it things are present are for its peace, since it rejoices only in temporal things. It turns away from seeing the things of the future, which might trouble its present content. And so we have, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. Our Jerusalem is also wept over, for after sin enemies surround it, that is, evil spirits, and cast a trench about it, so that they may besiege it, and not leave a stone upon a stone, especially if after great self-denial, and after many years of chastity, should someone, seduced by the allurements of the flesh, and overcome, lose both patience and chastity. And should he commit fornication, they will not leave in him a stone upon a stone, as Ezekiel says, All his justice which he hath done shall not be remembered. Or again, the spirits of evil besiege that soul going forth from the body, which they caress with delusive joys while it was occupied with the desires of the flesh. They cast a trench about it by bringing before the eyes of its mind the memory of all the evil it has done, and enclose it round about with the company of the damned, so that caught in this last extremity of life, it sees itself ringed around with enemies, yet cannot find a way of escaping them, for it is no longer able to do good works, and those it might have done it despised. They also shut the soul in on all sides when they unroll before it all its sins, not alone of deed, but also of word and thought, so that the soul which before spread itself in evil in many directions may now at the end be hemmed in from all of them as a punishment. Then the soul is beaten flat to the ground because of its state of guilt, when the body, which it believed to be its life, is now pressed hard to return to the dust. Then the children who are in it fall down in death, when the forbidden thoughts, which come only from it, are scattered in the final retribution of life. And these thoughts may also be signified by the stones, for when the corrupt mind adds one perverse thought to another, it, as it were, places one stone upon another. But when the soul is led to its final punishment, the whole structure of its thoughts is demolished. Yet God visits the wicked soul at all times through his teaching, and he sometimes visits it by means of chastisements, and sometimes through a miracle, that it may learn the truths it did not understand, and though still rejecting them, may, move by sorrow, return to him, or may, overcome by his kindness, become ashamed of the evil it has done. But at the end of its life it knew not the time of its visitation. It is delivered over to its enemies. And entering into the temple, he began to cast them out. When he had recounted to them the evils that were to come, forthwith he entered the temple, to cast out from it those who bought and sold there, showing us that the destruction of the people was in great part the fault of the priests. And so we read, And entering in he began. For God does not wish his temple to be a place of buying and selling, but an abode of holiness. 
neither does he intend the exercise of the sacerdotal ministry to be an act of religion that is bought, but rather a service freely given. There were in the temple a great number of dealers who sold the animals that in accordance with the ritual of the law were to be slain as victims. Now the time was at hand for the shadows to end, and for the reality of Christ to shine forth. Because of this, Christ, who together with the Father was worshipped in the temple, commanded that abuses of the law should be corrected, and that the temple should become a house of prayer. So there is added, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer. For they who resided in the temple, in order to receive offerings, sought, there is no doubt, to injure those who gave them none. The Lord did the same at the beginning of his preaching, as John relates, and here does it a second time, which made it a greater offense for the Jews, that they were not chastened after the first correction. Mystically, you may understand as the temple Christ himself as the man, or the body united with him, which is the church. It was as head of the church, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up again. The temple, of which he seems to have said in the same place, take these things hence, means the church united to him, meaning that there would be those in the church who would seek their own ends, or who would find there a place of refuge for the concealment of their wickedness, rather than seek there the love of Christ, and being pardoned through the confession of their sins might reform their lives. Our Redeemer does not withhold the words of his preaching from either the unworthy or the ungrateful. For this reason, after he had defended the authority of the divine law by casting forth wrongdoers, he here makes known the gift of his grace, for there follows, and he was teaching daily in the temple. It was but fitting that from what Christ had said and done they should adore him as God, but the Jews, far from doing this, sought to kill him. Please go to the next tape. Bishop and Doctor, a prayer for the gift of tears. O Lord Christ, word of the Father, who came into this world to save sinners, I beseech thee by the innermost depths of thy mercy, cleanse my soul, perfect my actions, put in order my manner of life, Take from me what is harmful to me, and what displeases thee. Grant me what thou knowest is pleasing to thee and profitable to me. Who but thou alone canst make clean what was conceived of unclean seed? Thou art the omnipotent God, infinite in mercy, who makest sinners just, and givest life to the dead, who changes sinners, and they are sinners no more. Take from me, therefore, whatever is displeasing to thee, for thy eyes can see my manifold imperfections. Stretch forth, I beseech thee, the hand of thy mercy, and take from me whatever in me offends the eyes of thy goodness. In thy hands, O Lord, are my health and my infirmity. Preserve me in the one, heal me in the other. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. Thou who dost heal the sick, and preserve those who are healed, Thou who by thy nod alone dost renew what is ruined and fallen. For if thou wilt sow good seed in thy field, there is need also to pluck from it the thorns of my sins by the hands of thy mercy. Most sweet, most kind, most loving, most dear, most precious, most desired, most lovable, most beautiful, Pour out into my breast, I beg of thee, the fullness of thy sweetness and charity, so that I shall not think of or desire what is carnal or earthly, but rather love thee alone, keep thee alone within my heart and upon my lips. Write with thy finger upon my heart the precious remembrance of thy sweet name, so that no forgetfulness may ever from there erase it. Write thy will and thy law upon the tables of my heart, that always and everywhere I may have thee and thy holy precepts before my eyes, O Lord, of unending sweetness. Inflame my soul with the fire thou didst cast upon the earth, and willed it to be enkindled, 
so that with welling tears I may offer thee daily the sacrifice of an afflicted spirit and of a contrite heart. Sweet Jesus, O good Jesus, since I long for it and implore it of thee with my whole soul, grant me thy chaste and holy love, that it may fill me, hold me, possess me completely. And grant me that visible sign of thy love, a cleansing, ever-flowing fountain of tears, that these tears may also bear witness to thy love in me, that they may show, that they may tell, how much my soul doth love thee, that in the too great sweetness of thy love it cannot withhold its tears. I remember, O Lord, that good woman of whom Scripture speaks, who came to thy house to implore of thee a son, that after her prayers and tears her face was no longer changed. But remembering her great virtue, her great constancy, I am afflicted with grief, overcome with shame, for I behold my miserable self lying prone upon the ground. For if she so wept and persevered in weeping, this woman who sought a son, how should not that soul lament and cease not lamenting with love and desires God, and desires to come to him, how it should not weep and mourn day and night, loving only Christ. Look upon me, and have pity upon me, for the griefs of my heart are multiplied. Grant me thy heavenly consolation, and despise not this sinful soul for which also thou didst die. Grant me, I beseech thee, in thy love, the inward tears that can dissolve the chains of my sins and fill my soul forever with thy heavenly delight, so that I may merit to obtain, if not together with thy true and perfect monks, whose steps I am unable to imitate, then at least with thy devoted women some little place within thy kingdom. There comes also to my mind the wondrous devotion of another woman, who with pious love sought thee, lying in thy tomb, who when thy disciples departed from the tomb, did not depart from it, but sad and grieving sat there, and long and sorely wept, and getting up again in tears searched with anxious eyes in every corner of the tomb, that somewhere she might see him whom she looked for with such fervent longing. Once and again had she entered and seen the tomb, but there is never enough to the soul that loves, for the crown of a good work is perseverance. And because she loved more than the others, and loving, wept, and weeping, sought, and seeking, persevered, so did she merit to be the first of them all to find thee, to see thee, to speak with thee, and not this only, but the first to tell the disciples themselves of thy glorious resurrection, thou commanding continued weeping, the woman who looked for the living with the dead, who with the hand of faith touched thee not, how should not that soul mourn, and cease not from mourning, which believes in her heart, and confesses with her lips, that thou art her Redeemer, ruling from heaven, and reigning everywhere? How ought not such a soul both weep and mourn, which loves thee with all its heart, and longs with all its being to see thee? O soul refuge and soul hope of the unhappy, to whom we can never pray without hope of mercy, for thy sake and for thy holy name's sake, grant me this grace, that as often as I think of thee, speak of thee, write of thee, read of thee, preach of thee, that as often as I remember thee, stand before thee, offer thee sacrifice, prayers and praise, so often may I weep the tears welling sweetly and abundantly in thy sight, so that tears may be my bread by day and night. For thou, King of glory and teacher of all virtue, by word and by example, hast taught us to weep and to mourn, saying, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thou didst weep for thy dead friend, and thou didst weep over the city that was to perish. I beseech thee, O good Jesus, through these most blessed tears and through all thy tenderness, by which thou didst wondrously come to our aid, who were lost. Grant me this grace of tears my soul so longs for, and now begs of thee. For without thy gift of it I cannot possess it. 
By thy Holy Spirit, who softens the hard hearts of sinners and moves them to tears, grant me the grace of tears, as though thou didst grant it to my fathers, in whose steps I should follow, that I may bewail my whole life as they bewail themselves by day and night. By their prayers and merits who have pleased thee and most faithfully served thee, have mercy on me, thy most pitiful and unworthy servant, and grant me the gift of tears. Water me from above, and water me from below, that day and night tears may be my bread. May I become in thy sight, O my God, a sacrifice, rich and full of marrow, through the fires of thy compunction. May I be wholly consumed on the altar of my own heart, and may I, as a most acceptable holocaust, be received by thee as an odor of sweetness. Grant me a strengthening fountain, a clear fountain, in which this defiled holocaust may be continuously washed. For though by the help of thy grace I have offered myself wholly to thee, yet in many things I daily offend thee, because of my great weakness. Grant to me, therefore, this gift of tears, O blessed and lovable God, especially because of the great sweetness of thy love, and also for a remembrance of thy mercies. Prepare this table before the face of thy servant, and grant me this power with regard to it, that as often as I will I may be filled from it. Grant me in thy kindness and thy goodness, that this thy chalice, so good and so inebriating, may quench my thirst. Let my spirit long for thee, let my soul burn with thy love, forgetful of all vanity and of all misery. Hear me, O my God, hear me, O light of my eyes, hear what I ask of thee, and grant that I may ask of thee what thou wilt hear. Kind and gentle Lord, be not hard to me because of my sins, but because of thine own goodness receive the prayers of thy servant, and grant me the answer to my prayer, the answer to my desire, through the prayers and merits of my Lady, Mary Virgin, and of all the saints. Amen. St. Gregory, Pope and Doctor, given to the people in the Basilica of the Blessed John, called the Constantiniana, on the end of life. I desire, brethren, if it is possible, to run briefly through the explanation of this short lesson of the Holy Gospel, so that those who know how from the knowledge of a few things to reflect on many may be given a fuller understanding of this. That the Lord, on this occasion of his weeping, described to us that overthrow of Jerusalem which took place under the emperors Titus and Vespasian, there is no one who has read the history of that disaster can doubt. For the Roman rulers are here referred to when he says, For the day shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee. That he also added, They shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, bears witness even to the very translation of the city itself. For the former Jerusalem, as we are told, was wholly destroyed, while the present city was constructed outside the gate, upon the site where our Lord had been crucified. He then adds the reason why this chastisement was inflicted on Jerusalem, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. For the Creator of all things had deigned, through the mystery of his incarnation, to visit it, but it had not concerned itself either with his love or with his fear for it. And because of this the prophet rebukes them, and even invokes the testimony of the birds of heaven against them, where he says, The kite in the air hath known her time, the turtle and the swallow and the stork have observed the time of their coming, but my people have not known the judgment of the Lord. But first let us ask ourselves, what is the meaning of the words, Seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known. The Redeemer did indeed weep beforehand over the destruction of that faithless city, and which the city itself did not know was to come upon it. And rightly does the weeping Lord say to it, If thou also hadst known, meaning that you also would weep, you who now rejoice, 
since you know not what threatens you. And because of this he adds, and that in this thy day, the things that are for thy peace. For while it was giving itself over to the pleasures of the flesh, and saw nothing of the evils that were to come, it already possessed, and in its own day, the things that could have been for its peace. Why it held present things as the source of its peace is made clear when he said, Now they are hidden from thine eyes. For if the evils that threatened it were not hidden from the eyes of its heart, it would not have rejoiced in its present good fortune. He then goes on to add the punishment which, as I said, threatened it from the Roman rulers. And having described this, what the Lord then did is related. Entering into the temple, he began to cast them out that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. That he recounted the evils that were to come, and straightway went into the temple to cast out those who bought and sold there, makes very evident to us that the destruction of the people was in great measure the fault of the priests. For by describing to us the disaster to come, and then scourging those who bought and sold in the temple, by doing this he shows us from where the disaster had taken root, and we know from the account of another evangelist that doves were sold in the temple. What does this symbolize but the gift of the Holy Ghost? But he drove from the temple those who bought and sold there because he is condemning those who gave the imposition of hands for money and those who attempt to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. Of the temple he goes on to say, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. For there is no doubt that those who remained sitting in the temple to receive gifts sought to do harm to those who gave them nothing. And so the house of prayer had become a den of thieves, for such men made it clear that they were there in the temple prepared to injure physically those who did not give them gifts, and indeed to destroy spiritually those who gave them. But because our Redeemer did not deny the words of his preaching, either to the unworthy or to the ungrateful, after he had upheld the authority of his teaching by casting out the perverse, he reveals to them the gifts of his grace. For there is added, and he was teaching daily in the temple. We have run through these things, touching briefly on the simple record of what happened. Because we now know that Jerusalem was overthrown and changed for the better by its overthrow, and since we know the thieves were driven from the temple, and the temple itself uprooted, we ought from these outward happenings draw inwardly a certain similitude from these ruined structures of stone learned to fear the destruction of our own inward life and conduct. Seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known. He did this once, when he foretold the city would perish. In no way does our Redeemer cease from doing this, through his elect, when he sees that some have departed from a just life to an evil way of living. And he weeps for those who know not why he weeps, for those who in Solomon's words are glad when they have done evil and rejoice in the most wicked things. For if they but knew the hour of their own condemnation, which is close at hand, they would weep for themselves with the tears of the elect. Well do the words that follow apply to the soul that will perish, and that in this thy day the things that are for thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. The perverse soul which takes its joy in this passing hour has here its day. Here it finds the things that are contented. For a while it takes its joy in earthly things. For a while it is puffed up with vanity. For a while it grows feeble through bodily pleasures, and then, when it has lost its fear of the judgment to come, it has peace in its own day, to find it a gravestone of stumbling on that other day of its damnation. For there it shall be afflicted, while the just rejoice, all the things that now are for its peace will then be changed into the bitterness of contention. For it will begin to rage within itself, for having closed its eyes from seeing the evils to come. For this reason he says to it, 
but now they are hidden from thine eyes. For the perverse soul that is given over to temporal things and weakened by bodily pleasures blinds itself to the evils that pursue it, for it turns from looking ahead at things to come, lest they trouble its present delight. And in abandoning itself to the allurements of this life, what else is it doing but hurrying with closed eyes toward the everlasting fire? And because of this, it was well written, that in the day of good things be not unmindful of evils. And regarding this, Paul says, and they that rejoice as if they rejoice not, so that should you rejoice in this present world, let you so take your joy of it, that the remembrance of the judgment to come is at the same time never far from your mind. For in the measure that the anxious soul is penetrated with the fear of final punishment, the more its present delight is taken with moderation, the more shall the wrath to come be tempered. And because of this was it written, Blessed is the man that is always fearful, but he that is hardened of mind shall fall into evil. For the wrath of the judgment to come will be the harder to endure, the less it is now feared here in the midst of evil doing. And then we read, For the days shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee. Who were ever greater enemies of the human soul than the spirits of evil? who caress it with delusive joys while it gives itself over to the lust of the flesh and lay siege to it as it is about to leave the body. They cast a trench about it when they bring before the eyes of its mind the remembrance of the sins it has committed, and they encompass it around by dragging it into the company of the damned, so that held fast in this supreme hour of its life, it then sees by what enemies it is surrounded and yet it cannot find a way of escape, for it may no longer do the good works which, when it could do them, it despised. Of such as these the words that follow may still be truly understood. They shall compass thee round and straighten thee on every side. The spirits of evil straighten the soul on every side when they unroll before it its own iniquities, not alone of deed, but also of word and even of thought so that the soul that before had spread itself out in many directions in wickedness, now, at its end, is pressed in on every side in punishment. And then there follows, And beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee. Then the soul will be thrown to the ground through the knowledge of its own guilt, when the body, which it believed to be its life, is pressed hard to return to the dust. Then shall its children fall down in death, when the unlawful thoughts that now come forth from her are scattered in the final chastisement of life, as it was written, In that day all their thoughts shall perish. And these shameless thoughts can also be understood as stones, for there follows, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone. For the perverse soul, when it adds to a perverse thought, another thought more perverse, what is it doing? but laying stone upon stone. And as in the destroyed city not a stone is left upon a stone, so when the soul is led to final judgment, the whole structure of its thoughts is demolished. He adds the reason why these things are suffered, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. For the omnipotent God is wont to visit each soul in various ways. He visits it continually by his commandments, sometimes with the rod, sometimes by a true miracle, that it may pay attention to the truths it is ignoring. And should it still continue in pride and contempt, it is stung with anguish that it may return to him, or overcome by his kindness that it may be ashamed of the evil it has done. But when it was far from knowing the time of its visitation, at the end of its life it will be given over to those enemies to whom it will be joined forever by an eternal sentence of everlasting damnation, as it is written, When thou goest with thy adversary to the prince, while thou art in the way, endeavor to be delivered from him, lest perhaps he draw thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the exactor, 
and the exactor cast thee into prison. Our adversary, in the way, is the word of God, which in this present life is in conflict with our carnal desires. And from this adversary he is delivered who is humbly subject to his commandments. Otherwise the adversary will draw him before the judge, and the judge will deliver him to the exactor. For in the final judgment of the judge a sinner will be held guilty if he has despised the word of the Lord. And the judge will deliver him to the exactor, for he will permit the evil spirits to drag him to final punishment, to demand for torment the soul now is driven from the body, and which of its own will had conspired with him in evil doing. The exactor casts it into prison, for it is thrust down to hell by the evil spirit until the day of judgment comes, after which he also will be tormented in the fires of hell. When he had finished with the destruction of the city, which we have used as a similitude of the soul that is perishing, he goes on to say, And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought. As the temple of God was in the city, so the life of religious is now among the Christian people. And oftentimes many will put on the religious dress, and while holding the state of sacred orders, drag the ministry of holy religion into the business of earthly trading. For they sell in the temple, who give at a price that which belongs to certain persons as a right. To serve justice in return for money is to sell it, and they buy in the temple, who while refusing to render to their neighbor what is due to him, and while despising to do what they are bound by their office to do, with their master's possessions, they buy themselves sin. To men like these was it well said, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it in a den of thieves. For it may sometimes happen that unprincipled men will have the care of some holy place, and where they ought to bring life to their fellow men by the merits of their prayers, they kill them rather by the sword of their wickedness. The soul and conscious conscience of the faithful is also the temple and house of God. And should this bring forth wicked thoughts for the injuring of our neighbor, these will, as it were, settle there like robbers in a cave, slaying one by one those that pass by, thrusting the swords of their malice into those who are without fault. The faithless soul is now no longer a house of prayer, but a den of thieves, when scorning the innocence and simplicity of holiness, it tries to do what it can to injure its neighbor. But since we are instructed without ceasing against all such perversities of conduct by the words of the Redeemer throughout the sacred pages, even now he is doing what we are told he then did, and he was teaching daily in the temple. For truth teaches daily in the temple when it carefully instructs the mind of the faithful, that it may guard itself against these evils. And we shall know that we are being truly formed by the words of truth, if we have ever fearfully before us the thought of our last end. As another wise man has warned us, In all thy works remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. And we ought to dwell daily on what we have just heard from the lips of our Redeemer, and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. For as long as the just judge bears with us, and does not put forth his hand to strike us, and while we seem to have a certain time of freedom from anxiety concerning the last judgment, we should reflect upon the evil that follows it, and reflecting, grieve and grieving escape it, and keep ever before us the sins we have committed, and recalling them, weep over them, and weeping over them, wipe them away. Never let the joy of some passing good fortune undo us, and neither let any passing thing blind the eyes of our soul, lest, blinded by them, they may lead us to the eternal fire. For if we consider carefully, we shall come to see the gravity of the reproach that proceeded from the mouth of truth, when he said to the careless city that gave not a glance to the things that were to come, 
and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. For we should ponder deeply how fearful that hour will be of our final dissolution, what dread of soul shall be within us, how long the memory of all our sins, what blotting out of all past joy, what fear and apprehension of our judge. Which of the things of this life should delight us, when though they will all pass away together, that cannot pass away that there awaits us? When that passes away forever which we loved, and that begins where grief never ends, then will the spirits of evil seek the fruits of their labor in the soul that is going forth. Then will they unfold the record of the wickedness to which they urged it, so that they may drag it, now their partner, down to torment. But why speak only of the perverse soul, when they also come to prey upon the elect, as they go forth to find, if they can, something in them that is theirs? One alone was there among men, who with untroubled speech said, before his passion, I will not now speak many things with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and in me he hath not anything. Because he saw that he was a mortal man, the prince of this world had thought to find in him something of his own. But he who came into this world without sin went forth from it free of this world's corruption. Not even Peter dares to say this of himself against the prince of this world. Peter, who merited to hear the words, Whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. This Paul did not presume to, he who before he paid the debt of death, had penetrated the secrets of the third heaven. And neither did John venture to say this, John who because of his singular love leaned on the breast of the Redeemer at the supper. For when the prophet says, For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. He who came into this world in guilt cannot be without guilt in this world. And for this reason, the same prophet says, In thy sight no man living shall be justified. And Solomon says, For there is no just man upon earth that doth good and sinneth not. For the same reason John also says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And because of this, James also says, For in many things we all offend. It is therefore very plain to us that all who are conceived of the delight of the flesh, beyond doubt, the prince of this world has something of his own in their thoughts or their words or in their actions. But the prince of this world could not hold fast to them before this, nor afterwards snatch them away, because Christ had freed them from their debts, because he who was without debt had paid for us the debt of death, that our debts might not hold us fast under the power of our enemy, because the man Jesus Christ, the mediator of God and men, had freely paid for us what he did not owe. For when he paid for us the unowed death of his body, he freed us from the death of the soul we owed. Therefore he says, for the prince of this world cometh, and in me he hath not anything. And so for this reason we should consider with anxiety, and ponder daily with many tears, how greedily, how fiercely, the prince of this world will come seeking what is his, upon that day of our going forth from here, since he came even to God dying in a body upon the cross, seeking something even from him, in whom he could not find anything. And what could we unhappy creatures say? What could we do, we who have committed endless sins? What could we say to our enemy when he comes seeking us and finds in us so much that is his? Had we not this as our sure refuge, this as our firm hope, that we have become one with him in whom the prince of this world sought for something of his own and could not find anything? From among the dead, he alone is free. It is true, and we do not deny it, we truly confess that the prince of this world has in us many things. Nevertheless, at the hour of our death he is unable to seize us, 
since we have become the members of him in whom he hath not anything. But what does it avail us to be joined by faith to our Redeemer if we separate ourselves from him by our manner of life? He himself says to us, Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must therefore join good works to a true faith. Let us repent daily of the evil we have done, and let the good we do for the love of God and our neighbor abound more than our past offenses, and let us never refuse to do to our brethren whatever good we can. For in no other way shall we become members of our Redeemer unless by holding fast to God and having compassion on our neighbor. And as it happens that the hearts of those who listen are moved to love God and our neighbor more by example than by words, I shall try to tell your charity about a miracle that my son, the deacon, who is here present and who was born in Asia Minor, told me took place in Greece. There lived, he says, in that place, a certain monk, a very venerable life, named Martyrius, who on one occasion went to visit another monastery ruled over by a holy abbot. And on his way he met a certain leper whose members were all afflicted with elephantiasis, who was trying to return to his dwelling, but could not through weakness. His house, he said, was on the road along which Mar Mar Martyrius was going. The man of God had compassion on the weakness of the poor leper, and so he spread his own cloak upon the ground, and placing the leper upon it, wrapped him securely in the cloak, and lifting him up upon his shoulders, brought him along with him. And when they drew near the monastery gates, the abbot of the monastery began to cry out with a great voice, Hurry, hurry, run quickly and open the gates. Brother Martyrius is coming and bringing the Lord with him. As soon as Martyrius reached the entrance to the monastery, the man he thought was a leper leaped down from his shoulders, and Jesus Christ, true God and true man, appearing in that form in which the Redeemer of mankind was known to men, returned to heaven before the eyes of Martyrius. And as he was ascending, he said to him, Martyrius, you are not ashamed of me on earth, I shall not be ashamed of you in heaven. And when the holy man went into the monastery, the abbot said to him, Brother Martyrius, where is he you were carrying? Martyrius answered, Had I known who it was, I would have held him by the feet. And then he told him that while he was carrying him, he felt no weight, and it was not to be wondered at that he could not feel his weight, who upheld him who was carrying him. And from this account we should reflect upon the power of fraternal compassion and on how closely the inward mercy of the heart unites us to Almighty God. For we then draw near to him who is above all things when through compassion for our neighbor we renounce even our own selves. In material things no one can touch what is placed above him unless he reaches up. But in spiritual things it is certain that the more we lower ourselves through compassion, the more closely do we come to the things that are on high. See how it was not enough for our edification that the Redeemer of mankind should tell us what he will say at the last judgment, as long as you did it to one of my least brethren, you did it to me, unless he also gave us before the judgment a vision in himself of what he had said to show us that whoever does good now to those in need does it in particular to him for whose sake he has done it. And the further anyone is from despising one who appears contemptible, the greater the reward he will receive. For what in human flesh is more sublime than the body of Christ, which was exalted above the angels? And what in human flesh is more abject than the body of a leper, filled with running sores and giving off repulsive smells. But see how he appeared in a leper's flesh, and how he who is to be revered above all men does not disdain to be seen as the most abject of men. Why is this, if not that he might teach us who are slower of understanding, that whosoever is eager to come before him who is in heaven 
let him not refuse to be humble on earth, nor to have compassion on his brethren who are abject or despised. I had intended to speak briefly to your charity, but the way of man is not his own, and the word running swiftly cannot be held back. And this he has so ordered of whom we are speaking, who lives and reigns with the Father in the unity of the Holy Ghost forever and ever. Amen.